Office for Energy System Integration at NREL, Mark Alstrom, the Vice President of Renewable Energy Policy at NextEra Energy, and the Board President of DSIG, and myself. I will serve as the moderator and the lead-off presenter on the background of DSIG and how we got to where we are. Mark O'Malley will pick up with a brief explanation of what energy systems integration is all about, and Mark Alstrom will conclude with a discussion of the Energy Systems Integration Group mission and opportunities. Uh, let me begin the introductions with a brief biographical sketch of myself. I'm Charlie Smith. I've served as the full-time executive director of ESIG since 2003. I'm very active in the IEEE and some other international organizations, including CGRAE, the IEC, and the IEA, and also the World Energy and Meteorology Council. I think many of you know me as the guest editor of the biannual IEEE Power and Energy Magazine special issue on integration of wind and solar power, which I've been doing since uh, 2005, I guess. So it's my pleasure to next introduce our two main webinar speakers, Mark O'Malley and Mark Alstrom. Mark O'Malley is on sabbatical from UC Dublin in Ireland, currently at NREL, where he's the chief scientist for energy system integration and the chair of our research and education working group. Mark started the very well-known and well-respected Electricity Research Center at UC Dublin and is recognized around the world as a leading authority on renewable energy and energy systems integration. He was also the founder of the International Institute of Energy Systems Integration, IIESI, which you'll hear a little more about during the webinar. Mark is both a colleague and a good friend, and we're very happy to have him working with us. Next, I'd like to introduce Mark Alstrom. Vice President for Renewable Energy Policy at NextEra Energy and the Board President for ESIG. Mark has been very active working with NERC on the Essential Reliability Services Working Group during the past four years, and has given a lot of thought to the reliability of the bulk power system and the role that wind and solar forecasting play in market design and operation. He frequently speaks on behalf of ESIG on wind and solar and energy system integration topics, where he is a real thought leader in the industry. Mark is another longtime friend and colleague. We've worked together on many projects over the years and continue to work closely on ESIG activities. Okay, so that's a little bit of background and introduction, and I'm gonna go ahead and get started with the background on ESIG and uh, how we got to where we are. So first, just uh, kind of summarizing what I said, three parts of the presentation, I'll give some background on how we got here. Mark O'Malley will talk a little bit about ESI and what's it all about, and then Mark Alstrom on the mission and opportunities for ESIG. So it all started in 1989, a group of six utilities. They were just starting to see some wind coming into their system. I think there were three California utilities. They were seeing more than other folks. Got together and decided they'd like to learn a little bit more about what wind power was all about and what it was going to do to the system. Worked with EPRI and DOE to get a small group started, mostly a self-educational activity in the beginning. And that uh, grew slowly during the 90s as wind spread from California to Texas, to the upper Midwest, to Minnesota, some of the early development places where a lot of activity is still going on. Membership grew slowly. I think by 2003, we had about 50 members, up to 180 members today. The major focus during that time was wind integration challenges and solutions. That was the primary concern and interest. Back in those days, people thought once they had more than, you know, three to five percent of their annual energy coming from wind or penetrations in the five to ten percent instantaneous region that, you know, very bad things were going to happen and the system was going to collapse and couldn't operate a system with so much uh, wind generation on it. And we just kept learning kept doing and learning and getting to higher and higher levels and at the levels where we are today and still learning, still doing. So <clears throat> once we got through the 90s into the early 2000s, really began to recognize a lot of the similar uh, problems and solutions, even though every system was a little different. Um, as you got more and more wind, you started seeing the same issues associated with power system planning, power system operations, the interconnection of the wind plant to the power system, uh, performance of the system during disturbances. And uh, people realized that there was more 
more to learn than just looking at the uh, plants in isolation, that you really had to look at the whole system, all the pieces operating together. And that's what we did through through UWIG in those days, the Utility Wind Integration Group in the in the very early days. We really spent a lot of time listening and talking to each other, breaking down the uh, barriers that existed between what were really two silos, the power systems folks and the renewable energy development folks. Spent a lot of time building communication and understanding, which was very a worthwhile thing to do. The wind integration literature drew, grew dr dramatically during that time. Not only the um, IEEE power and energy special issues, but also we did a, uh, a full volume of the IEEE transactions on uh, sustainable energy devoted to uh, wind integration. And it, you look at the literature, the technical literature, you can see that it really blossomed during that time with uh, articles on the integration of wind and eventually solar power on the power system. And as we got more and more and as the ISOs uh, came into being and played a larger role, the problems of the individual utilities as far as operations concerned really diminished with the consolidation of balancing areas once you aggregated uh, the wind energy over a very large region and smoothed out a lot of the variations. And once the ISOs uh, got well uh, well operating and had uh, very fast markets with near real-time forecasting. The problems that were uh, anticipated with the operation of the system became uh, a lot less. And that continues to this day. And then by the end of the first decade of this century, around 2010 timeframe, solar began to appear, <clears throat> began to appear in quite a, uh, a measurable and remarkable way. Our members said, hey, you know, I'm starting to see a lot of solar on the system, and it looks a lot like wind in the sense that it has a fair amount of variability and uncertainty, and maybe, you know, UWIG could expand and include the considerations associated with solar in the planning and operations of power systems. So we did that, and in 2011, we became the Utility Variable Generation Integration Group to include uh, both solar and wind in our activities. And then the uh, system continued to change and evolve. It was becoming clear by the 2015, 2016 time period that renewables were really going mainstream. They were no longer a uh, sort of strange form of generation that had to be integrated into the power system. They were becoming the power system, a very significant part of the power system. And some, <clears throat> some circles, they were viewed as a disruptive force. They were going to cause a major change in utility business models. Utilities were no longer dealing with a traditional vertically integrated model of the system, but they're dealing with uh, prosumers instead of customers, people who produced as well as consumed. And the realization dawned that the prosumers and the renewable energy sources were going to be very large contributors to the energy in the future. So recognizing this change, we spent about two years through our board planning process, coming up with a strategic plan for what we wanted to look like in the future uh, to deal with this change that was happening. And that's how we uh, we got to be the energy systems integration group, recognizing that the, all the energy systems needed to be integrated, not just renewables into, into the electric system. And the name change, energy systems integration group, was approved at our annual membership meeting just uh, held in March of this year. One of the things that we realized, and uh, looking back through the UVIG annals, uh, Mark O'Malley found this slide, going back to an <clears throat> October of 2006, 2006 UVIG meeting. Uh, look at the Danish power system in 2005 on a couple of week period in the winter time when for the first time, the wind plant output started to exceed the minimum load on the utility system. And this was really a very, kind of forward-looking, um, eye-opening experience at the time and has only become more so since that time, back around the time that this uh, experience was just beginning, Denmark was probably receiving 15, maybe 20% of its annual energy from wind. Today it's receiving around 40% of its annual energy from wind. So this really was an eye-opener and gave people uh, a little bit of early insight into what was coming down the pike. 
The other drivers that uh, were behind the evolution of ESIG and the formation of ESIG were just a plain old recognition of societal pressures for clean energy and energy efficiency. People want clean energy. They don't want dirty air. They don't want um, problems with water or land or, <clears throat> or uh, excess energy or that didn't need to be consumed. So energy efficiency was an important consideration as well as clean energy. And the pressure began to build on major utilities and corporations globally from shareholders, employees, and customers to make the transition and companies provide what their customers want. Also, the recognition, as I showed in that previous chart, that there could be massive curtailments of clean, zero marginal cost energy, which could be put to better use if there was a tighter link between the electric system and other systems, heat systems, fuel systems, transportation systems. And there was a recognition on the utility side for the opportunities for load growth with further electrification, and also the availability of cheap <coughs> communications and big data helped move things in this direction. More recently, since uh, the Denmark, uh, Denmark picture first became clear in the early 2000s, we have a report from Northeast China Grid Company, part of State Grid Corporation of China, largest utility in the world and also a member of ESIG. This is going back to 2012 now, estimating that 23% of wind generation has been curtailed in 2012. The situation is still very, um, it's, it's very significant in China, the curtailments that are taking place and the amount of effort that's being devoted to expanding the flexibility of the system to be able to deal with these massive curtailments in the energy system. And this is a driver, uh, this concern for curtailment is a driver all over the world. It's a driver in China, it's a driver in Europe, it's a driver in the U.S. So uh, a lot of people trying to figure out what the future looks like. This chart here is from the BP uh, outlooks for 2035, and there's a stacked bar chart that shows five, the last five years of pro projections, 2014 through 2018, for primary energy from six different sources, and it's given in millions of tons of oil equivalent. And the two really interesting ones, I think, well, they're all interesting, but coal, going from a little below 5,000 to a little below 4,000, like a 20% reduction in their forecast between now and 2035. This is from BP, one of the largest oil producing companies in the world. And you look at wind and solar going from about 1,000 to 2,000 MTOE from now until 2035. So large decline in the coal burning, large increase in wind and solar production. But the other thing that's interesting, you know, hydro and nuclear are pretty flat, gas, was going down and we got it kind of coming back up a little bit. But the oil projection from an oil company, and basically what they're saying is they think that by 2035, the use of oil will probably have peaked and it's starting to come down a little bit. And I, I think that's a significant uh, piece of information from the um, largest, one of the largest oil companies in the world. The next era energy earnings call in January 26th was also very interesting, something that really kind of knocked my socks off, comments by CEO Jim Robo, predicting that by the early 2020s, it's going to be cheaper to build new renewables than to operate existing coal and nuclear plants. And the cost he was talking about were unsubsidized new wind at two to two and a half cents a kilowatt hour, unsubsidized new PV at three to four cents a kilowatt hour, and variable operating costs of existing coal and nuclear plants of three and a half to five cents a kilowatt hour. That's pretty significant coming from one of the operators of the operators of one of the largest fleets of nuclear, coal, and renewable resources in North America. The uh, reporter David Roberts uh, offered the opinion that if these predictions hold up, it's game over for coal and nuclear unless it gets support based on its low carbon emissions. So that's a pretty strong opinion, but I think it's an interesting one. So there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, in the U.S., there's many, many opportunities for increased renewable integration and efficiency benefits from stronger links between energy systems. So it's not just about getting the renewables into the electric system. It's about getting the renewables through the electric system and into the other systems, other heating systems, other 
fuel systems, other building systems, other transportation systems. Europe and China probably have stronger links in that direction already, but still a lot of opportunities. And in all regions, there's benefits from stronger links between the electric fuel and transportation systems, especially when you consider the transportation systems consume about one third of the you know, world's fossil energies and electric systems consume about another third. Those are two really big, big users. And major opportunities <clears throat> for improved reliability with all of the new technology that's coming out at both the bulk and the distribution system lever, level and very interesting opportunities to redefine power system dynamics and stability with all of this converter interface generation. And I mentioned uh, transportation because it is such a huge consumer of fossil energy and there's such a huge opportunity for uh, replacing or displacing the fossil fuels with electricity through increased energy systems integration, not just in electric vehicles, electric cars, but trucks and buses and trains. It's a, a very large opportunity worldwide, and many people think that it's only going to be accelerated with all of the interest in autonomous uh, vehicles that we're seeing. So something that we're certainly going to keep our eye on as things progress. And next, I would like to turn it over to Mark O'Malley, who will continue with the um, discussion of energy systems integration and what it's all about. So, Mark, I'm going to pass the ball to you. And uh, hopefully you're, you're not on mute and we'll continue here. Okay. Thank you, Charlie. <clears throat> I'm glad to know that Charlie introduced me as a friend and colleague. That's, that's very comforting for me. <laughs> so, okay. So, uh, I'm Mark O'Malley and Charlie has introduced me very well. So, I will I'll just pop on to the next slide. So, just to go... Uh, Oops. Okay. <clears throat> so Charlie mentioned the International Institute for Energy Systems Integration briefly, so I think it's appropriate for me to say a few words about it. So it was established in 2014, became a formal organization in 2016. It was driven mainly by NREL and some others, very much with a research focus and very much with a global focus, and also in somewhat contrast to UVIC, very much an energy systems focus as opposed to electricity. Uh, and in the past year, when the opportunity came to merge with Charlie's organization to found with EC, we thought it was the ideal thing to do. So I think that uh, it's been a very good idea to merge two organizations together. So let me, next slide. So my job is on this call is to try and give a little bit of background about what is energy systems integration. The text in front of you is a very formal definition that uh, NREL and EPRI and a few others have, have put out in a couple of documents. I'll just read it out. Energy systems integration, ESI, is the process of coordinating the operation and planning of energy systems across multiple pathways and or geographical scales to deliver reliable, cost-effective energy services with minimal impact on the environment. In the next slide, I'll go into a little bit more detail. The word I want to highlight in this text here is coordinating. Uh, it's we did have the word optimization in there at one stage, but we felt that that's a little bit too sort of mathematical uh, because in many ways, I think what we're trying to say here is we're trying to deal with the whole system. So it's not just engineering. This is engineering, economics, policy, et cetera. So we found the word coordinating to probably be a bit better descriptor. The next slide shows a graphic that I've used and several other people have used over the past number of years as energy system integration has developed. On the left-hand side, you see customer, city, and region, and that's to give the, the linkages between the, across the different scales. <clears throat> On the top right-hand side, you have electricity, thermal, and fuel. There are the energy vectors. <clears throat> They're starting to couple together. Charlie gave some good examples there already, some initial examples, and I'll give some more examples. Also, though, importantly, down the bottom right-hand side, we've got water, data, and transport, and we recognize that they themselves are not energy vectors, but Linkages to other infrastructures is also important. Water is a very large user of energy, and a lot of energy uses needs water, et cetera. Data is obviously a very important part of this because it enables all this, and Charlie's already mentioned transport. So down at the bottom in a few bullets are some sort of, um, I'll go through them. So it's the optimization of energy system across multiple pathways and scales, or coordination is probably a slightly better word in terms of, of uh, describing it, because it's not just purely a mathematical thing. 
You're obviously doing this for some reason, increase reliability and performance and minimize the cost and environmental impact. So there has to be a purpose to this. We just don't integrate things for just for the fun of it. And Charlie said it very well, people want more clean energy, more efficiency. So there has to be some objectives to this. Uh, the next point I think is the most important of all, um, because many people, when they see this figure, they say that's the entire energy system. And in many ways, we are dealing with the entire energy system, but we're only interested in where it's most valuable at the interfaces where the coupling and interactions are strong and represent a challenge or an opportunity. So where there's a coupling across the scales where it's an opportunity or a challenge that's interesting from an ESI perspective, same goes for the energy vectors and the same goes for the other infrastructure. So it's not the entire energy system. It's at those interfaces where the coupling is strong and this is a problem or, a, or and or an opportunity. And finally, as I've said before, this is not just an engineering thing. The control variables in this are technical, economic, and regulatory. So in order to sort of give some, you know, some definition to all that, I'm going to give a few very quick examples. We do not have an awful lot of time in this webinar, so I'll just give a few quick examples. This slide here shows you the wind in monthly wind generation in Ireland in May 2018. This is available on Airways website. Uh, May is not a particularly windy month historically in Ireland, but if you can see there, it's around about 25% of the electricity comes from wind in Ireland in May. During the winter, it could be up around 40 or 50%, and during the middle of the summer, it could be down around 10 or 15%. The Ireland's wind penetration at the moment is around 25% on a yearly basis. The next slide then shows one particular day, just to highlight the, you know, on some days it gets very high. And again, May is not a particularly windy month in Ireland, but 9th of May in Ireland, you can see active system demand and wind. If you look at it, you know, I'd say 40, maybe 50% of the electricity that day was produced by wind. The point of these two slides then from an integration, energy system integration point of view is, is really highlighted by this. Next slide. This is a slide by Michael Milligan from NREL. Uh, it shows you a load profile. It then shows you a wind profile over time, and then the net load. And you know, from an economic perspective, uh, if you have wind, it's zero marginal cost, as Charlie said. From an economic perspective, you should try and take it. So if you try and take all that wind into the system and integrate it, the red profile, which is the normal profile that system operators face on a day-to-day -day basis, becomes the blue profile. And the blue profile, if you look at this, there's some highlights there, steeper ramps, lower turndowns. And it's been coined many times before. With variable renewables, we need more flexibility. So the rest, the balance plant, the other plants of the system need to ramp up faster, ramp down faster, and go down further. So this is the requirement for flexibility. And if you go to Airgrid's website, and look at the fuel mix for the month of May 2018. Given here in the next slide, you can see it's split into coal, gas, net imports, others, and renewables. And you can see renewables is 23.78% in May. And that's, you know, May is, is, is a sort of a shoulder month between the winter and summer. So, it's a, and I, like I said, I think our penetration level is around 25% at the moment. But the important point here is that gas is nearly 60%. One of the reasons, and it's not the only reason that Ireland has been very successful in integrating, it's, it's an island, remember, it's been very successful in integrating variable renewables is because gas is the, is the other fuel that's involved. And gas has, by its nature and by the design, is essentially a much more flexible generation than others, like, for example, nuclear and, and coal, which will be much less flexible. The next slide, I think, shows that. So gas grids have storage, illustrated here in that pipeline on the left, and gas generators are flexible. I mean, remember, most a gas generators essentially is a combined cycle gas, a gas turbine is essentially the same technology that drives a jet engine on a plane. And they're incredibly uh, flexible, very easy to start, very easy to ramp up, etc. So one of the reasons that Ireland had success at integrating renewables is because of the link between get the gas system and the electricity system, and that highlights an example of energy system integration. So I'm going to give two more examples. And like I said, there's many, many examples, but here's another example. I'll just do this in one slide. So this shows uh, heat and electricity coupling. So on the top left-hand side of this slide, we have transmission lines, and then uh, it's not a very high-quality picture, unfortunately, but on the next to it on the right-hand side is a, is a thermoelectric storage heater. 
it's essentially a storage heater, electric storage heater. There's a piece of work that we've done uh, in Ireland about looking at term electric storage heater and what advantages they bring to the system. So this is from the consumer to the national scale to highlight the integration across the scale. So this is from the consumer's home right up to the national grid. This is in terms of these term electric storage heaters being controlled by the system operator. So that's the integration across the scale. Uh, but very importantly as well, on the left-hand side, you see the little comic showing key or on, term and comfort, reserve, provision call, key or off, provide reserve, might cause term of discomfort. It's very important in any of this that the consumer requirements act as a constraint on the operator. And the reason I highlight this is because this is not just about technology, economics, and policy, but it's also about the consumer. Uh, some of our, um, in, in IISI and now in ESIC, some of our new members and new people are very interested in social sciences and human behavior, and that's a very important aspect of this. And on the right-hand side and the bottom are some results from this piece of work we did, and as you notice, Heat output and heat requirements are identical, which is exactly what you want. This is a simulation showing providing, uh, in this case, it's load shifting, but you must do it in a way that does not impact on the comfort of the consumer. I want to give one more example. Um, this is, I call this poorly coordinated policies. This is uh, an image that comes from our colleague, William Dowsley from KU Leuven. And it's, it's to represent what's happening in Europe at the moment, to some extent. Europe is very keen on increasing, uh, reducing carbon. Uh, it's got a lot of subsidies for, for renewables. So you can see wind and PV there on the left on top of the iceberg. And they're pushing off the edge into the killer whales now. They're pushing off coal and gas. However, you would think that the, uh, the ETS, the little seals on the bottom in the sea, are this is the emissions trading system. Because coal has twice as much carbon approximately per kilowatt hour produced, it's got two seals dragging it off because it's, it produces twice as much carbon. But because the carbon price, the ETS system in Europe is essentially not functioning, it's not given a proper price for carbon. In fact, what's actually happening in, in Europe is that uh, gas is coming off the bars and not coal, which is not what you'd want. So the policy here is a lot of subsidies going into wind and solar, but in fact, because of interactions between these different policies, it's actually gas is closing. So from a carbon point of view, that's not exactly what they wanted. So it's to show that this is not just, you know, integration plus the physics, but also from a policy perspective, you must make sure that the whole thing integrates well together. So that's a few examples. Uh, I will now pass the ball over to our next speaker, who's Mark Alstrom, uh, President of the ESIG Board of Directors. He's Charlie's boss. Uh, so, he's a VP for Renewable Energy Policy for Next Area Resources. So, hold on that. Let me just do this. Okay, Mark, I've passed this to you. Thank you, Mark. We have an awful lot of marks here. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I want to just uh, kind of set the stage now for why the organization is, is taking on this, uh, this much broader scope of energy systems integration. Uh, these are very exciting times, of course, uh, with, with renewable integration, what's going on with storage, what's going on with markets in general. You know, but as Charlie uh, pointed out, renewables are mainstream and they've always been really a major catalyst for innovation in the industry. But it's going well beyond that. Uh, we've made a lot of progress in understanding a lot of the system issues, especially with integration of renewables at the bulk level. Uh, but we're also seeing this, this increase in electrification, as Mark O'Malley was just describing. You know, we, we actually think that load will and should increase. Uh, and that's, that's kind of a, a novel concept. So let's discuss that just a bit. What this really means is that, you know, the organization has to change too. And we'll talk about what the organization does to help everybody with these problems. Uh, obviously, we're going to continue to take on a lot of the issues around deployment of variable generation, distributed generation, battery storage, what's going on in markets and everything else, forecasting, for example. But, you know, we actually believe, understand the core issues that have to be done. We haven't done them all yet, but we understand how to clean up the electricity system. So we do expect to see a lot of growing electrification of other energy vectors, and we think that's a good thing. We think that electricity load should actually increase because we know how to clean that up. And uh, we, you know, that's really what Mark O'Malley was talking about, this concept of uh, overall 
energy system integration will look at all these other energy vectors and we will electrify more of that over time. So that's really what the energy systems integration group is all about now and that's why we changed the name. You know, we're going to continue to be a, a major uh, source of uh, convening of meetings and collaboration uh, to get people together to solve these problems. Uh, we're a nonprofit educational association that convenes workshops and provides resources for things like this. Uh, we really are all about collaboration. You know, we're forward leaning, but we are not advocating for, for a particular position from a policy point of view. We're really looking at where do we think these, these technical issues are headed. And then we want to convene the engineers, the researchers, the technologists, the, uh, the economists, and everybody that's involved with this, as well as policymakers and the public so that we can really help figure out common solutions for these problems in a way that's economic, reliable, sustainable, thoughtful, and collaborative. We really think that, you know, the main reason we exist is to get people to the table together so we can actually solve these issues. And really, that's our, that's our membership. Charlie pointed out we have over 180 members and we're growing quite rapidly right now. Uh, and these are from all, all sectors here. Uh, you know, we tend to be more technical. A lot of the people that attend, uh, you know, are, are in the, the engineering and technology, you know, equipment and operations and uh, market, you know, market operators and so forth. But increasingly, we are having a, a growing area of, uh, of university participants, uh, other, other types of people from around the world. Uh, we have a long history of working with the Department of Energy and the various energy labs, both in North America and internationally. But it's this diversity that really gives us our strength. We have to get all these people together to sit down and actually solve these issues. And what we found is that through our meetings, uh, people are able to actually talk more freely and, and kind of debate things at a technical level that they just can't do in a lot of the other more formal, like stakeholder processes and, and policy type activities, you know, in their, their country or their region. So we think that the Energy System Integration Group really fills a, a very special niche here. Uh, we also have uh, a half a dozen working groups and user groups. Uh, these are in addition to our larger technical meetings that Charlie mentioned that we convene on a regular basis several times a year. These are smaller groups that are kind of self-selected to help kind of be at the cutting edge of what's going on with some of these, these topics. So these groups, groups will meet uh, informally uh, as part of our technical meetings, but separately, usually before the main meetings convene. And they're really kind of uh, looking at issues that are even further out that will eventually show up on the agenda of our larger technical workshops. Uh, and so I'll run through these briefly just to talk about really how I expect these groups to also be changing to take on this larger energy system integration uh, challenge. A system planning working group, of course, we have to plan a lot about how we're going to get additional services and flexibility out of all of our resources on the system. Uh, and of course, what Mark O'Malley was talking about is a big part of this as we start looking even beyond electricity into gas and heating systems and other energy vectors. These all have to be planned. You know, a lot of, a lot of discussion has happened at NERC, like around the central liability services that was mentioned. And the key message there is that these are all solvable engineering problems. We do need to plan for them. We need time to plan and implement a lot of this stuff. So planning, of course, is a key part of making sure we're comfortable with ongoing, you know, reliability and economics as these changes occur. The reliability working group is a very active area. Uh, Charlie mentioned the essential reliability services work that's been going on at NERC and very similar uh, work at, in Europe. You know, we've been in a lot of discussion at recent meetings around how do we have coordinated frequency response and ride through characteristics as the generation mix changes, how we're we going to plan for that and make sure it's all operational and working, and other changes that we're also alluded to in terms of uh, protection as we move from synchronous resources into increasingly non-synchronous resources, you know, like wind, solar, and battery storage. Uh, we're also, you know, a lot of work going on with hybrid modeling because we realize that the distribution system and types of resources that, you know, we never really modeled before that are maybe combinations of uh, PV and, and battery storage, for example, are going to be a key part of this as well. 
So we really have to up our game in terms of our modeling of how we deal with reliability and understanding. Obviously, there's a lot to do when it comes to real-time operations and market design. Uh, you know, we're seeing more and more participation of, uh, of econo you know, economists and market designers and, uh, and the RTO, ISO system operators and the transmission system operators around the world. As we look at market changes to allow us to actually use all these resources and the transmission system and the distribution system in a more unified way. That's only going to become more and more uh, interesting, I think, as we get into this world we, where we have uh, uh, much, much better uh, information technologies, the data that we can get, the communications we have that we can use to come up with optimal solutions of how we're going to deploy everything and make it all work together. And then distributed energy resources, we have a working group on that as well. Uh, this is, you know, so far been, been kind of influenced mostly by distributed uh, PV solar and uh, behind the meter storage and other things. But clearly this has a key part of what Mark O'Malley was talking about as well, because a lot of these other energy vectors have to go down into the distribution system. You know, it's more than just the bulk energy system going forward. Uh, you know, basically all of these other vectors and these distributed pieces become part of that system and have to be coordinated in a, in a useful way. Uh, obviously, it's a lot of short-term work as uh, even the distributed energy resources we have now uh, be more tied in with liability through things like the updated IEEE 1547 standard here in North America and similar work that's been done in Germany and elsewhere on, on the liability contributions for distributed resources. But this all has to work together and, and stay reliable. And Mark O'Malley uh, talked a bit about this new research and education working group that, uh, that really is being led around the whole concept of energy systems integration. Uh, you know, they're working on a research roadmap. They're working on a massive open online course to help educating on this because it really is kind of the cutting edge of, of what has to be, uh, you know, what we have to educate people about. Uh, and they're also really leading our push for the organization into a even more global sort of context. Uh, we'll be starting up some new meetings uh, under the uh, ESIG banner, uh, international here like London in March 2019, which will be our international meeting uh, on energy system integration. And so we really view that as, as pulling in a much stronger uh, research and global reach for the organization. And then the last of the groups is a very well-defined uh, uh, operational uh, operations and maintenance user group. This is uh, really looking at once these sort of resources become rather mainstream, as has happened with wind and now solar, uh, we find that our members really want to uh, understand how to operate those resources better. And so this is a separate meeting. We get about 150 people together every spring and fall on a focused meeting just on operations and maintenance. And they go into great detail and they're sharing best practices and, and suggestions about how they can operate different types of plants, you know, in a better way. Uh, this is has o, you know, OEM specific roundtables, you know, or if you want a particular type of equipment, you can actually sit down with other people who are also operating that and really kind of share your experience with that. And we found this to be a very, very dynamic area. And uh, we, you know, already it's expanding beyond wind and solar into uh, substations and storage and expect it to grow into uh, energy system integration type topics as well. Uh, let me just emphasize that, you know, this uh, energy system integration group is in increasingly global. I mean, we, we've had global members for decades, but uh, we're seeing a lot more going on now around how we share best practices from around the world, how we solve these issues together. And we're all about doing a lot of things collaboratively. Uh, we have a lot of jointly sponsored workshops around the world. Uh, we bring in speakers you know, from all parts of the world for all of our workshops. And we're increasingly trying to do a lot of collaboration with, uh, with all other types of, of labs and organizations and international organizations, as Charlie mentioned, and they're listed here. You know, so this, this really expands on a long history of us of convening meetings to bring people together. And increasingly, we have to do that in a collaborative fashion with other organizations as well. 
So really, I just want to emphasize that the Energy System Integration Group is all about energy systems, not just electricity, not just renewables, but how we're going to make this entire system work together in an increasingly interconnected way. Uh, our organization is really about solutions. It's not about, not about advocacy or, or policy in the traditional sense. It's getting people who really have the technical understanding of what has to be done together so we can solve these things in a, in a collaborative way. And that means all the industry players, all the different industries and energy vectors, and, and all the regions of the world have to get together and, and figure this out together. So to summarize, you know, ESIG is, I, I think, one of the best places to go, period, you know, in terms of really sitting down to solve these things in a way that is economic, reliable, sustainable, thoughtful, and collaborative. We have to get people from across the entire spectrum, you know, from the technical to the, the economic to the policy to the operations, the planning, you name it. This takes a real collaborative approach. And we think the Energy Systems Integration Group is a very unique place in providing the, the workshops and the resources, uh, the members only, uh, you know, working groups that we have uh, with shared areas on LinkedIn groups and so forth, where we have ongoing collaboration between meetings. You know, our website that has resources for everyone and uh, the archive of the material that we put together and then we share through our meetings and our workshops on a regular basis. So I look forward to expanding this beyond our, you know, our almost 30 years experience of doing that with wind and then solar, uh, now into the broader perspective of energy system integration. And I hope we can grow electricity load and, and, uh, and move that entirely you know, forward into a cleaner uh, energy system, not just an electricity system. So with that, I think we'd be happy to take questions and uh, talk about this further. Thanks. Mark, thank you very much. And Mark O'Malley, thank you. <clears throat> I just would remind people that we have a question and answer box in the lower left. We left about 15 minutes to cover uh, Q&A at the end here. I see we have one question, but before we get into that question, let me ask a question that uh, the two Marks can respond to to kind of set the stage for some of the other questions. I get a lot of people telling me, hey, Charlie, you know, the electric system was complicated enough. You know, it was all I could do to keep up with what was going on in, in uh, transmission and distribution and planning and operations. And, uh, you know, to become an expert in anything was very, very difficult. How in the world can we really get our arms around energy systems integration and become expert in everything in all of these other energy systems? And uh, I'd, I'd like to give Mark and Mark a chance just to take a little, uh, a little uh, bite at that question. So which one of you would like to go first? Well, I will. This is Mark Ostrom. Uh, and I'm, Mark O'Malley, of course, has told us consistently when we talk about energy system integration that, you know, we're not going to bite it all off at once and you don't have to electrify everything at once, you know, but certainly there are very practical steps that we will take. And so like everything, I think this is a, a methodical engineering approach that we have to, to make. It's not an all or none thing. But I would emphasize that I think what renewables have, you know, one of the reasons they've catalyzed a lot of the work that we're doing in the energy sector is the increasing use of digital controls and, and inverter technologies, which uh, on the one hand is very disruptive because we had so many decades of, of dealing with, you know, synchronous generators that are just nice big heavy spinning generators. And so there's some, some issues and some, some teething pains there that are being worked through. But that digital type approach permeates all this. And I, I really often say that, you know, the energy system is kind of the last holdout for the digital revolution that's going on. You know, everybody else is already going, you know, massively digital, big data, cloud computing. I mean, it's uh, there's a lot going on there. Um, we're going to see more of that. So I'm not at all afraid of the complexity or the amount of data or computing that's really necessary here. You know, I think that we will figure that out. Complexity is not really a bad thing. 
uh, you just have to come up with good architectures and approaches for dealing with that so that you can you can manage it and get the advantages of, of all that information. Yeah. Uh, I'm still waiting for digital kilowatt hours to be sent as email attachments to my house so I can unhook. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mark O'Malley, would you like to take a, <clears throat> a crack yeah, at the Charlie, I'll, 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 I'll take a different perspective on that. I think <laughs> that... Uh, one thing is that we could all live as long as you, Charlie, and then we could become expert in everything, but since most of us are not going to live as long as you are, considering your age, uh, that's one way to do it. But I think the way to do it is, from my own experience, is that you need people who've got depth in their own expertise area, whether that's electrical engineering or whether that's social science or economics or policy or whatever. Uh, and they, they need to collaborate with each other because there's no way that an individual could become a real expert across the whole range of areas. So that's why I think ESIG is such an important uh, organization that it enables that. I mean, from my own perspective, I've been working on integration renewables for 20 years. Uh, I think I know some parts of it reasonably well, but what I found is that as you get to very high penetrations, you start having to consider other things much more seriously than, than you did before. And you have to start working with experts in the field. So I think that one of the reasons why eSig is such a good idea is because in order to solve these problems, we have to collaborate. That's yeah, a very good perspective, I think. I would also just add one thought to that, that um, the electric system is, <clears throat> is still the uh, sort of the central um, pathway, if you will, central connection, central link between all the others, and it's going to continue to be a, a very important, critical part of it. So it's not like we're going to lose our focus on the electric system to focus on the gas system or on fuel systems. But as Mark says, the uh, specialists from different areas will work together. I've been working on this for 100 years, like Mark said, and I still haven't mastered it all. <laughs> okay. So I see we have uh, a question about um, launching a nonprofit group advocating for power to fuels on the West Coast and curious about who to coordinate with in uh, NREL and ESIG. So who do you think a power to gas uh, group should coordinate with an NREL, Mark? Well, so I'm sure I could find so that someone sends me an email afterwards. But I, just to put an international perspective, it is power to gas goes on Lots of, I, I would suspect that part of gas is very strong in Germany as well, just to give an international perspective on this. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm willing to take an email from somebody if they want to talk about it. Okay. And as far as ESIG goes, probably our system planning working group is a yeah. uh, good place to, to bring that question up. But also the research and education group, because a power to gas, certainly is an interesting technology, but needs a lot of research to bring its costs down to make it more cost competitive. Yeah. Okay. I'm having a hard time with these questions here. Send. Um, question from a graduate student asking about how, uh, how they might get involved with ESIG in the Boston area. Uh, maybe Mark. Alstrom, you want to say just a few words about our um, activities with scholarships and trying to involve students more, and then maybe Mark O'Malley say a few words about their research and education working group? Sure. Yeah, we have, we have many universities that are members of, uh, of ESIG, and uh, the, the, corp, the, the basic model for membership in ESIG is usually it's the organization, whether that's the university or the company or the RTO or whatever that, that joins, and then all of their members or students are, are members of the organization. Uh, if, if the you know, university or whatever is not a member, we have a very low cost uh, membership for individual students, so you can participate at member rates and get access to all the member-only materials as well. But uh, we're, we have quite a few universities that are members and, and more that are joining all the time. And, uh, and Mark O'Malley, it's really your, your emphasis on ESI that is, is driving even more of that going on right now. Yeah, so just so on the universities, I think that historically, Charlie, I'd say that you had some universities, but you know, universities wasn't, there wasn't a lot of them. IISI had some more. There's, I think, after the merger and after what we're doing, I think that more universities, we're, we're trying to get more universities to join. 
and I think they should. Um, so I'd say that's the first point. I think the other point is the, the Research and Education Committee also is trying to develop some courses, and we have run courses in the past for PhD students. But I think it's an area that we need to grow in terms of our activity, is more interaction with the universities. We need them to be involved with us. Because if this is going to be solved by the next generation. I think we may have enough issues for the next two generations anyway. Okay, <clears throat> a question here on the, um, on the impact that differences across jurisdictions, including differences in assets, energy infrastructure, climate, industrial demand, uh, have on integrating the uh, energy system, and how do we deal with these differences, these regional and geographical differences within ESIG? Can I, can I answer that or to make an attempt yeah. to that, Charlie? Sure, please Yeah, do. so I mean, my, my experience is, is that I think it's as shared by many people is that when it comes to this type of integration work, every system is unique. There's no, it's very rare you come across two distinct systems that are exactly the same because there's so many dimensions to it. There's the, the physical issue, the geographical location, the, the historical policy perspective, the, the market structures, et cetera. So there's just so many, it's very unusual to find two systems the same. So every system solution is unique, and I think that is an important point to make. And I think what it is is, and that, so people can learn from some fundamental understanding from other systems, but every system must generate its own particular solution. I think that's why it's so important to educate the world about this. I don't think you can buy the solution off the shelf. I think you gotta look, learn some of the fundamentals and then apply to each system. I would just add too that uh, yeah you're, you're right that every system needs kind of to be uh, in some way customized and optimized for its particular current state of its uh, of its jurisdiction and its policies that are in effect. But you know what we're what we're doing these days is pretty amazing ways to to build and optimize that through a lot of the uh, uh, machine learning type you know data science kind of activities now so. By understanding the various components really well, you know, through through ESIG and and by sharing information with each other, you know, I'm very confident that there'll be many many vendors and utilities and others who will come up with with very optimal solutions for these complex spaces. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of work out there to do for sure. Here's an interesting question, uh, talking about the the fact that engineers are very good at solving technical problems, but maybe not so good at solving political problems. And a lot of the problems that we face in the future are political or policy problems, as, as Mark showed in his slide with the power plants falling off the cliff with the, uh, the wee animals in the ocean there. So um, how is the, uh, how are the political hurdles being dealt with or how do we propose to help in this area, or can we help in this area? How can we make a difference in helping to solve the non-technical and non-economic issues that affect the future of energy systems integration? So can I, I'll, I'll, I'll give an answer to that, Charlie. Ahead, so without naming, without naming names, I had a phone call from a, um, a diplomat, a very senior diplomat from in, I won't say the country, who, where, where they're from or where they are, and uh, about this whole issue, and they wanted to, they wanted some insight about what the problem was. And I mean, I came to the conclusion that the problem wasn't really technical; it was really a political issue. That that you know, technically, what they were asking about could be achieved, and they agreed. And um, what they did say to me was that they need people like us to give them the information in a succinct and clear way that they can then use it politically. So. Uh, I don't think I mean to think we're we're not a political organization, so we're not getting involved in politics. But I think we can give the political people the information in the right way that they can use and make sure it's factually based and they can use it. So I think we can definitely help for sure. But I, but I agree with the question. A lot of the problems are political; they're not actually technical. But at the same time, you need all the technical and the scientific background to be correct, and you need to educate these people about. It. Yeah, we really we really need translators I think that can take these complicated, you know, multi-dimensional sort of technical issues that we're talking about here, 
and express those in common language and tell people what's important. And, you know, that's what we really work on developing a lot of our workforce as well. You know, how can we get common understanding and then move beyond the technical audience into the policy and, and the general public? Uh, legislators and regulators have a very important role in the future of the, uh, the entire energy system. And I, I agree, it takes a very, a very special talent to be able to synthesize and distill all of the technical information that's uh, out there into something that's understandable and actionable by by uh, the policy folks. So that certainly is an area where we can help. Uh, one of our uh, commenters notes that we've been talking about flexibility and ramping for a, a long time and <clears throat> hoping that we're going to spend as much time talking about uh, oversupply in the future and asking if oversupply is a priority or I would say a concern moving forward. So again, Charlie, I'll jump in. I mean, just to say that, and we're getting a little bit down into the weeds here, but curtailment of renewable energy is a form of flexibility. So that's the first thing, it is actually flexibility. However, if it gets to be a lot, it becomes an economic issue. I think that's one of the reasons why, you know, we're, we're looking at this energy system integration is that we need to sort of take the excess electricity possibly from wind or solar and electricity system and put it into another energy vector. So I think it is, it is an important, a very important thing. Uh, but, but again, I'd stress, I, I don't think curtailment in itself is a bad thing. It's, it's, it's a little bit of curtailment I think is actually a good thing. Because uh, it shows you probably designed the system just right, but a lot of curtailment is a, very, is a bad thing economically. And therefore, I think that's why we have to work. That's why that question the, earlier on about the, the, the power to gas is so important. That's why the whole issue of dumping electricity into heat or into, into uh, cooling or into transport is so important. And that's one of the, sort of the reasons for the existence of, of ESIC and this, this initiative. Yeah, I, I agree. You know, some, some curtailment is not a bad thing. It actually gives you more flexibility. What we really need is an increasingly uh, uh, flexible, controllable, you know, visible type system in some way so that we can coordinate all that. And I think when you look at the transportation system and the fact that it consumes about as much primary energy as the electric system does, that it uh, really highlights the the critical nature of the electric system and serving as a pathway for channeling that oversupply into areas that are undersupplied, which the transportation sector is at the at the current time. Okay, I'm going to ask uh, one last question before we close close down here, and that's about uh, kind of an age-old question on DC grids in the residential area. Batteries, PV cells, a lot of loads are DC. What do you see as the outlook for DC networks in neighborhoods? If anything, uh, I, it's not it's not an area that I'm spent a lot of time thinking about. But I mean, I think they have they they. I mean, let's be clear about it. PV is essentially DC. Why do we convert it to AC? So I think there's definitely opportunities for us. Um, how much, how much, where? I think is all system dependent. Again, goes back to my point that every system is different. So I think there's definitely opportunities for us. It will depend on the particular circumstances, and I think it will definitely grow, though. Um, it's an a age-old question. I think people have been asking that question for 100 years, and there's opportunities. It's got as much to do with standards and economics as it does with technology, but something that people will continue to be taking a look at, I think. Okay, we've reached the, uh, <clears throat> the top of the hour, so we're going to need to wrap it up. As I mentioned earlier, an email will go out once the presentation and audio file have been a post posted, let you know where it is, you'll be able to download it. We really appreciate your engagement and we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. It's going to be June 12th at 12 noon Eastern. The webinar will feature Ulrich Fakken, the uh, CEO of Energy and Medio, a German energy management and wind and solar power forecasting firm. We've been an active participant in UBIG and in our forecasting workshop for many years. The webinar is going to give a background on forecasting for virtual power plants and what that's all about. Again, it's meant for both existing and prospective members as an opportunity to develop a better understanding about the value of forecasting for a, an emerging area, both in Europe and in the US and, and China too. It will also serve as an interesting backdrop for our forecasting workshop the following week in St. Paul. 
I wanted to mention also the jointly sponsored webinar series from NERC uh, EPRI, the North American Generation Forum, and uh, ESIG on the topic of inverted-based resources. Further information on all of our webinars and these meetings can be found on our website at www.esig.energy under events and in our newsletters and informational emails. So thanks again to everyone for your participation. We look forward to seeing you the next time around and everybody take care in the meantime. Thanks, Charlie. Thank you.